Tonight on Real to Real, we're off to the spectrum to experience the excitement of a Flyers game and to meet a very special member of the team. Joe O'Neill is back with another edition of Vintage Video. This week's pick, The Miracle Worker. And Father Bob Curtis will join us for the locker room lesson on the simplicity of faith. All this and much more right now on Real to Real. Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minov. And I'm Pat Shelton. Welcome back to Real to Real. I wonder what's happening with charismatic prayer groups in the area. But for that matter, just what is a charismatic prayer group? Won't you stay tuned tonight and learn with me? We have so much to learn together that we can learn all about the variations of music and themes at the end. But uh, besides that, the charisms are many and, and, fr and beautifully fruitful. However, one char charism I like you to think about is your pastor. The role of a pastor has so many variations. They all refer to God. But did you ever think you'd meet the Padre of the Puck? He's warm, charming, fun-loving, and a member of the Philadelphia Flyers. Well, in a sense. As the unofficial chaplain of the Philadelphia Flyers ice hockey team, the Reverend John Casey is probably the only member of the team who has not spent time in the penalty box, or at least none that he's willing to admit to. In the penalty box? Uh, visits, just visits, to, uh, never because of bad conduct, no. No. Uh, I'm pretty clever in the referees I get away with a lot, see. A self-described sports nut, Father Casey's love for hockey began in Chicago while he was assigned to St. Rita High School. One night, he went to see the Blackhawks play and never missed another game for 14 years. My first 14 years as a priest, I was uh, in Chicago and uh, I went to the opening game and I didn't miss another game for 14 years. And I got to know them and uh, same thing I do with the Flyers, I did with the Blackhawks. So I, I still have great memories of Chicago and Chicago Stadium, and they had a big pipe organ. I used to sit with the organist, and uh, it was my ambition to play it, but he never, I, I was uh, kind of hoping he'd get sick so I could uh, do it some night, but he never did. In 1955, Father Casey returned to Philadelphia, where he joined the faculty of Monsignor Bonner High School. With the Blackhawks left behind in Chicago, Father Casey found himself a man without a team. And so, to remedy the situation, he bought a ticket for a Flyers game. And the rest, as they say, is history. When they came here, I was the first one in line to buy a ticket. And uh, then I just got to know everybody. Described by one Philadelphia newspaper as the most popular sports figure in town, Father Casey is by far the most famous member of the Flyers, surpassing even such all-time greats as Bobby Taylor and Bill Barber. Everybody in the world knows me. If that's See, I can't rob a bank or anything, because uh, uh, I'm recognized everywhere I go. Whenever the Flyers are playing well, on home ice, up, you will be sure to find Father Casey at rinkside, encouraging the team in his own quiet, reserved way. Father Casey, uh, if I can remember uh, when we played, was always there for us. Uh, he was a guy that uh, uh, probably rooted for us harder than anybody. I think even more than our mothers and fathers, <laughs> he, think he was cheering for us. But uh, he was a guy that uh, uh, really became a part of our hockey team. He was a, uh, a person that uh, uh, it was just like, well, here comes our team, our goalies, our defense, our forwards, and Father Casey. And it was great. Uh, uh, you know, he, he's not a very big man in size, but uh, his stature with our team was, was enormous. Although a priest cannot be officially assigned as chaplain to any sports team, Father Casey has been with the Flyers for 24 years, offering them his own special blend of friendship and spirituality. Hockey sports, professional sports, is a hard, pragmatic business. You trade people unsympathetically. You have to tell them their careers are over. Injuries happen. People come and go. So it is not uh, a personal, lovely, friendly, relationship kind of atmosphere. But what Father Casey has done all these years is provide a humanity, 
that gathering spot at the parties, at our luncheons, he becomes the single focus of just goodwill and kindness and generosity. When people say to me, what spirituality does Father Casey bring when he comes to game nights? I said, and I know how much spirituality he brings to players, but he certainly brings them some form of excitement by always being escorted by two or three lovely young ladies from Chestnut Hill. And they're always very attractive. So one day I said to him, just out of curiosity, I said, Father, aren't any homely girls out there? And he said, yes, the Protestants. Just as Gene Hart is considered the voice of the Flyers, Father Casey is considered their soul. And although he gives much to the team, he also receives something more than just free tickets to the games. I think Father, uh, I think he gets a lot of strength and energy from it. I think that, the, you know, it's a nice diversion from him, from his everyday activities, to go down there to the spectrum. It's a very uh, high energy place, and uh, I think he probably, you know, uh, is able to, uh, uh, gain some strength from the, the, the atmosphere down there and it, it projects it into his everyday life. I think what really, uh, as much as we thought he was a part of us, I think he felt so much more a part of us as well. Uh, you know, for him it was like we treated him just like any other uh, human being, you know, and a lot of times a lot of priests, as soon as somebody sees the caller, they get very nervous and they get very pious and, you know, and he was just like one of the guys. Father Casey not only touches the lives of those he meets, but is loved by everyone he comes in contact with, all of whom have nothing but good things to say about him. Well, if Father Casey had come to Philadelphia in 1680 instead of William Penn, all of us Quakers would be Catholics. That's the kind of man he is. Uh, I've known him most of my adult life. Father Casey used to come watch me play football for Haverford School back in 1936. Uh, and even then, he, he was taking bad boys like me and making them into good boys like I am now. I went to the Flyers game once, and he's told me, he's like, Bridget, just meet me at the press box, and I'll get you in, and meet you, you can meet all the Flyers and everything. Well, I met him at the press box, and I met all the reporters, but he, <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't let us into it. He, he said, uh, the wrong guard, he said, wouldn't let him in. When he is not offering his unique brand of assistance to the Flyers, Father Casey can be found serving as chaplain at the Mother House of the Sisters of St. Joseph in Chestnut Hill. The main duty the Father has is to say Mass for us, but the rest of the day he spends going about, going about doing good. He's a real pastor, not only to us, but to all the people in Chestnut Hill, students at Chestnut Hill College. When he is not engaged in his official duties, Father Casey can be found roaming the halls of Chestnut Hill College where he is affectionately known to everyone as simply Case. <laughs> On the college's most wanted list, Case shares his popularity around the campus with yet another flyer. Hey. Here. <laughs> Although Father Casey has accomplished many of his dreams in life, there are still a few ambitions which wait to be fulfilled. I think the one key thing that I, that I liked about him was that he always told me his three ambitions in life. One was to drive the Zamboni, two was to score on a penalty shot, and three was to get thrown out of a hockey game for being third man in the fight. Before I die, I would like to drive the Zamboni. And you know what the Zamboni machine is? It's the one that cleans the ice between periods. If I could just do that once, I could die happy. While other members of the Flyers are sure to come and go, there will always be one person on the team who will never have to worry about being traded. For just as he has been for the past 24 years, Father Casey will continue to be an ever-present part of the Flyers, who, whether they win or lose, will always have the Padre of the Puck on their side. He always claimed he was born at a train station, and that's why he's on time. Well, whether or not that's true, it's a joy again to see Father Casey. The story of Helen Keller, the blind, deaf-mute. From the stage to the big screen to your TV screen at home always translates into a story of faith, courage, and inspiration. Watch now as Joe O'Neill reviews The Miracle Worker, this week's vintage video. I saw a video the other day that made me think about how blind we can be to the unconscious way our friends and co-workers help us get through the day. 
In fact, they may not even know they're doing it. The movie is the 1962 film, The Miracle Worker, starring Patty Duke in the famous story of Helen Keller and her triumphant battle over the severe handicaps of blindness and deafness. But Helen Keller didn't do it alone. Like the people in our lives, she had help. A brave and unselfish teacher named Annie Sullivan brought Helen from the empty life she had in a sightless, soundless existence. And of course, our friends and her co-workers and Helen Keller's life with Annie Sullivan don't match in need or intensity of sacrifice. But the spiritual parallels are still the same. Our friends' simple hellos, their shared wisdom and knowledge, and their interest in our well-being gives us every bit as much spiritual strength as the relationship between Helen Keller and Annie Sullivan. Here's an early scene from The Miracle Worker. Helen's family pities the girl's primitive manners and ignores them. Her new teacher, Annie Sullivan, played by Ann Bancroft, will not. Could any of them compare even in that with old Stonewall? Well, the butcher simply wouldn't give up. He tried four ways of getting around Vicksburg, and on the fifth try, he got around. Anyone else would have pulled him What is the matter there? She is accustomed to helping herself from our plate, Miss Annie. I'm not accustomed to it. No, of course not. I'll get you another plate. I have a plate, thank you. Vani, she'll persist in this until she gets her own way. Vani, bring Miss Sullivan another plate. I have a plate. Nothing's wrong with the plate. I intend to keep it. <laughs> you see why they took Vicksburg? Miss Sullivan, one plate or another is hardly a matter to struggle with a deprived child about. Oh, I'd sooner have a more heroic issue myself, Captain Keller. Miss Annie, I don't think you know the child well enough. I know an ordinary tantrum well enough when I see one on a badly spoiled child. Miss Sullivan... Believe it or not, Helen Keller's life takes her to college, and she becomes a champion for the educational needs of the blind and the deaf. Without a friend and teacher like Annie Sullivan, it would have never happened. And to those who guide us when we're blind or deaf to the right paths to take, well, thanks. We'll never walk alone. See The Miracle Worker, available on MGM UA Home Video. This is Vintage Video. I'm Joe O'Neill. I think it's very important that you hear more about the Charismatic Renewal, so please stand by, we'll tell you about it. What exactly is, or what exactly are charismatic prayer groups? That's what I want to learn tonight. And I hope you'll stay with us as we talk with Father Ralph Chifo, the Archbishop's delegate to or for charismatic prayer, prayer groups. groups. That's right. That's very interesting. What exactly, Father Chifo, is a charismatic prayer group? Well, charismatics go back... Uh, Oh, in the Old Testament, a man or woman anointed by the Holy Spirit to really speak and witness that God was present through them and also in the history of salvation and God's saving graces. But we know the first Charismatics came alive on Pentecost Sunday when the apostles and the holy men and women were praying there for the renewal of the, the Holy Spirit so that they could be like Jesus throughout the world and, and preach and pray. And we know that day that they began to speak in, in language where everyone understood the message, the message of love, the message of, of Christ's salvation. And therefore, that's what we continue today in our Catholic Charismatics prayer groups, which came alive right after the Council of Vatican II. Uh, a group of young men and women realized that the devotional life of the church seemed to be failing. We were changing all the structures, but they wanted to change the heart. And they came in contact with the holiness or Pentecostal movement among many of our Protestant brethren. And through that, they kind of caught the anointing of the Spirit as they attended. And then it's been 
this, this was in around 1966, 67. And then through Duquesne University and then off to Notre Dame. And within several years, by 1970, when I attended the Notre Dame conference, there were actually representatives from most of the, the Christian and Catholic nations of the world that somehow the power of the Holy Spirit went out and small prayer groups began to flourish uh, throughout the country and even throughout the world, all starting from that one experience at Duquesne University in, in 1967. Now, you mentioned that there are similarities to the Pentecostal denominations, and you mentioned something about speaking in tongues. But for one who has never attended a, a charismatic prayer meeting, and for all of those at home who have not, what exactly goes on? What makes it different yeah. than just a prayer <laughs> meeting? We come already living our Catholic Christian faith throughout the week. That, that's basically the, the goal, is to live out that Jesus is alive, not only at the church or at the prayer meeting, but throughout the week. Mm -hmm. But then when we come to the prayer meeting, we actually celebrate, just the, as we would celebrate Mass, the liturgy of living our life of faith throughout the week. At the prayer meeting, uh, we start off with lively song and, and joyful praise of God because we believe that through worship and praise we become like the risen Jesus, that the okay. Lord promises where two or three are gathered in his name, that Very there he well. is, not only within our hearts, but also between us. Is there also personal witnessing? Right, then from, from the praise part, which could be done through scripture and also through sharing, we get into personal witness. How has the Lord worked in my life this week? You know, I prayed over my father, you know, whose leg was mm -hmm. not feeling well, and he experienced a, a grace there, a, a neighbor, a friend. And, a, and you're the Archbishop's delegate to prayer groups, and I understand it's only been officially recognized in, in the Diocese of Philadelphia as, since 1970. So this is comparatively something new to our Catholic Church here. Now, uh, Father Chifo, I understand there's some special workshops or something for men. Would you tell us quickly what that's yeah. about? We found out through the renewal of the last 20 some years that men and women share their faith differently. differently I mean, yeah. women, as they love, they're more relational, they're more personal, they're, they're more into their feelings, whereas men like to talk about their job, their work, what's, what's happening. But yet when a man has experienced the Lord Jesus personally, then all those feelings, that ability to cry and to laugh, that, that ability to relate to Jesus as a person, uh, it's difficult many times, especially when there are many women there, to just share their feelings. So what developed uh, even earlier in the renewal was some men's faith sharing groups and women's faith sharing groups, uh, not so much to separate them, but rather to bring out the best out of our own femininity and of our own masculinity so that when we come together at the prayer meeting, a man is more willing to, to witness in a personal feeling well. To let go, well. to rejoice, and rejoice. maybe to even cry. Yeah, and sure. this is the, the priest that you see often at the end of Real to Real, who announces where the next charismatic prayer meeting will be. Won't you pay close attention to those announcements, because uh, I think it's something that you'll enjoy. Thanks for coming and telling us about it, Father Chifo, and I'm looking forward to my first one. And won't you stay tuned for more of Real to Real? The man, 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 and dog, 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 dog. For years, this man thought if he just tried hard enough, he could teach himself to read. Where do you go when you can't do it alone? He's getting help in a literacy program for adults. They got help from the United Way. All because the United Way got help from you. The United Way. It brings out the best in all of us. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations and encourage you to write us at Real to Real, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, PA, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842. Whether it's Jerome Robbins or old, a new time song, Modern Praises, things of beauty are things of beauty because they keep basic principles in order. They remain uncomplicated. Literally, they keep it simple.
Jerome Robbins, a name synonymous with the golden era of Broadway. Remember Peter Pan, West Side Story, The King and I? They're doing a retrospective of his great works right here in this theater. And today, we're going to meet a man who started his career, his dancing career, in a Jerome Robbins hit almost a half century ago. And now he's a backstage dresser. The first show that I was in was Jerome Robbins' production of Call Me Madam at the Imperial Theater in New York, and I was 18. And the great thing about that, my partner, my first dance partner, turned out to be Cheetah Rivera. After decades as a star dancer, was it difficult for Fred to accept a dresser's role? Once you're in the theater, if you really like the theater, you want to stay with it. And being back in the theater, especially this show, it's like watching myself go down the hallways when I was 17 or 18 years old. Fred Cherish's priceless memories of musical drama's greatest stars. Tell me about Fred Astaire. What was he really like? He was wonderful and he was the heart. He worked harder than all the younger dancers on the show. He was brilliant. I mean, I just idolized that man. The dresser is a man of all seasons and reasons, constantly running when the show is on. When they call half hour and everything starts to put together, and then the overture starts, you know that you're, you're on a roll. There's nothing. You don't have time to go to the bathroom sometimes. I mean, you just keep going. And then at quarter of 11, you faint. But with the music rising and the dancing creating the illusions we love, Fred's ordeal has been worth it all. Every bit, every bit, even now. Even now, still being in the theater. I wouldn't give it up. Jerome Robbins Broadway will be touring the entire country starting in late spring. Don't miss it. You'll love it. I'm Doris Winkler with Senior Update. Sports writer Jim Murray wrote, There was a time in this country when bankers communicated in code to keep the riffraff out. Football coaches do much the same thing. They ennoble a playground game with a nomenclature that would do justice to rocket science. A locker room blackboard looks like a formula for heavy water or the theory of relativity. I couldn't agree with Jim Murray more. Sometimes I listen to the so-called analysts on Monday Night Football and wonder if I'm losing my ability to understand the English language. Experts always complicate things. That's their job. And religion, I've got news for you. Religion is no exception. Sometimes it seems that theologians write for each other and not for the rest of us. Jesus prayed this wonderful prayer. Thank you, Father, for revealing to the merest children what you have hidden from the learned and the clever. Witnessing an illiterate and homeless peasant crawl on her knees to the shrine of Guadalupe in Mexico City reveals far more about faith than any book of theology. Look, faith is simple. Pat, thanks for having Father Ralph to talk about charismatics. You know, I always, always say that I don't think I have the humility it takes to be a charismatic. Humility? You know, yeah. See, I, I don't know about that exactly. Why do you need special humility? Well, I think you have to be that open. You're uncompl again, uncomplicated. Oh, oh I see. It's, like, it's almost like laying your soul bare That's in right. public. Got to be open to accept yeah. what God gives you to do. Yeah. But I, so many of us can do it, and I think so many more people should be a little more open to listen and to pray and to be with their charismatic friends. I know. I, I can't wait to attend one. My friends who are charismatic say that they just find it so uplifting. Oh, it is. At the same time, um, you can just let your hair down, yeah. and, and they love it, and I want to go see what it is. I, I've been to, to many meetings and to many conferences and participated in a lot of them, but as I, I still think some of the gifts, I think I might be a little timid to accept the gifts that God might give me. I'm ready. <laughs> I want to go for it. I want to go Well, I hope it. you're ready, too. But we had such a joy being with you this year. And from now, after this week, we'll be doing some reruns for you. And you meet some old friends. So while you're watching from some old friends, I want to say goodbye and God bless you. Have a wonderful summer. So long for now.
We dedicate this Real to Real program to the memory of Bishop George Guilfoyle, fourth Bishop of Camden, whose ardent support over the years made Catholic programming throughout the Delaware Valley possible. Praise the Lord. I'm Father Ralph Chifo from the Charismatic Office. Jesus assures us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And each week at a charismatic prayer group, we experience through sharing, singing, and learning the joy of knowing the Lord with us. Become one of us and all of our brothers and sisters in prayer and the joy of learning about Christ's death and resurrection. Contact us at 668-HOPE. 